Good morning, Provost Newell, deans and senior leadership of Rowan University, deans, directors, and chairs of CMSRU, faculty, and students. I'd like to give a special recognition to our two plenary speakers, Dr. Ross McKinney and Dr. Cato Lorenzi, and if they could please stand and be acknowledged by our uh, audience. We're delighted to have them here today. A special thank you to our logistics team, Sharon Clark, Gail Urhu Stevens, Nick Stamatiades, Mike Funk, Harry Mazurik, and Drs. Halaska, Curry, Ferraro, and Pitari. Uh, this event would not be possible without all the hard work that they put into it. As a new school, we get to have many firsts, and this is one of them. And uh, this first revolves around launching our research agenda. Now, I appreciate that many of you have had long and distinguished careers in research, but for a new school, this is a very, very defining moment. And I'll tell you about a little bit about the genesis of this. In the first phase of our development as a school, we had to launch our educational mission first and foremost. And we also had to graduate our charter class and make sure that they uh, had great placements. But now in this phase, we get to be creative about our agenda and think about all the things that we really want to do, not just the, create, not just the uh, delivery of knowledge to uh, learners across the continuum, students, residents, fellows, but also the uh, creation of knowledge. And uh, that's what today is all uh, about. And this is in sync, of course, with our university, Rowan University, uh, which now has a Carnegie designation for research and also state designated um, research status. We've aligned our strategic planning in this regard with that of Rowan University. And uh, I'm delighted to see so many representatives, faculty, students, and deans uh, from our other colleges. Because I think that one way for us to advance as a relatively small organization is in the space of collaborative research. We do far better if we work together on this. So today celebrates uh, the uh, collaborative process that spins around a very visionary uh, examination of research for our university, and I'm sure Dr. Newell in his remarks will make more comments about this. So uh, our president, President Hushmand, approached the board and asked them to invest $50 million to jumpstart research. And this is quite an investment for Rowan University. Uh, our event today coincides also with the first phase of this program uh, under the auspices of our Office of Research at Rowan University with our new Vice President, uh, Dr. Bina Sukumaran. So with that said, um, I, will, I often get the question, does this mean we're changing our mission? And you know, our mission is near and dear to us. We use it in all phases of our uh, activity here, from recruitment of our students to our interactions with our community. And my response to that is absolutely not. It actually means that we will benefit the citizens of Camden far more through th this initiative. Um, we do a lot of important activities with our service learning. Our students in particular have been great champions of this. Our Dean of uh, Community and Diversity, Dr. Mitchell Williams as well. And uh, many of our faculty and staff assist with these activities. A medical school was placed here in Camden by the state of New Jersey to be part of the transformation of the city of Camden, which was once one of the great cities. And it was hoped that the educational institutions and the medical institutions would really jumpstart that. So for us to fulfill our obligation to Camden as our classroom, but also as our home, the next natural extension is to perform research that benefits Camden and that benefits its citizens. We often say we will fail as a medical school 
if we aren't part of the transformation of the lives of the citizens, where our school you know, calls it our, this our home. So that's a very important piece. So just to review some of the day's events, because Sharon wanted to be sure that I did this, uh, all of you should have a program. We'll be hearing some comments from our provost, Dr. Newell, shortly, and then the plenary address by Dr. Ross McKinney. We'll have lunch and posters. Our posters are around the corner in our um, multi-purpose room. We also have some posters in our learning commons. We received 130 posters. So thank you to all of those who uh, supported it. Then we'll reconvene at 1.45 in the auditorium and uh, Dr. Cato Lorenzen uh, will give our second plenary address. We'll have closing remarks and then there's an opportunity at the end of the day from three to four for some networking, get together, make connections. So when I went around to speak to the M1 students about this event today, uh, and many of them, they're excused from their events so that they could participate. We have overflow in our multi-purpose lab. I said to them, you know, you will not remember probably what you were going to be doing in class today, but hopefully you'll make a connection at this. You'll see a poster. You'll meet a faculty member. You might speak to our guest speakers and be inspired. So today is about inspiration. Today is about collaboration. I think the desire of all of you who gave up time from your busy schedules to support this event and to be part of our research agenda globally as a university, I think your desire is strong. You're passionate about this topic. So I thank you for that. I laud you for that. And with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jim Newell, our provost. Dr. Newell. So Annette asked me to say a few words about the importance of research at the university and then to talk a little bit about the $50 million investment. Um, from my perspective, there are really four distinct ways in which research is, is important to an academic institution. And that builds on Annette's opening statement. Universities exist for two very distinct but related missions. They exist to create knowledge and they exist to disseminate knowledge. And the creation of knowledge is obviously a key thrust of the research experience. But as I think about why this really matters, one of the things that we will not be talking about is money. We are not ever going to make money by doing research. That is not its intent. There's an economic reality of the cost of supporting research, and we need to make sure that the efforts that we do are sustainable, but it's actually an investment to reap the other benefits. And you know, when we first started talking about growth in research at the institution, at the time, research was a small component of what was happening at, at Rowan. We were doing less than $5 million a year of externally funded research about eight years ago. There, was a lot of, there were a lot of individual faculty members doing good research, much of it not in STEM, much of it with less funding, but it wasn't an enormous priority. In the, in the last eight years, that research level has octupled. So we were at $39.6 million this year. We're not going to be mistaken for Duke anytime soon, but that is enormous growth in a relatively short period of time. But the first school, the first college in the university that I came to talk to about the research mission was the College of Education. And the College of Education faculty had some fine researchers, but they were also very concerned about, does this mean we're going to lose focus on the undergraduate student? Does this mean we're going to drift from our mission? And one of the comments that I had for them was the idea that if you asked most people not on Rowan's campus, what did they know about Rowan University's College of Education? The answer you would get would be some form of they produce a lot of good teachers, and most of the teachers in South Jersey have Rowan degrees. Okay, that's not a bad thing to say. But what we would like that message to be is that Rowan University were significant factors in transforming P to 20 education 
in the state of New Jersey and beyond. And they develop some wonderful teachers. But to be able to do that, to have a role in shaping thought and policy, it's because you have identified yourself, you've been recognized as being a thought leader in the field. That comes from research. That comes from developing new ideas, from going to conferences and symposiums and research days and other events, and gradually being recognized as people who are not simply passing information, but who are developing that information. The college has transformed. It has one of our doctoral or PhD programs. It has a very active research thrust. They actually have multiple faculty with, with awards in excess of a million dollars each in research funding. And that's not a STEM program. That's the College of Education. When I think about the second level, it's really about the students themselves. There is a discipline to research. It is a path of inquiry and discovery that does not get simulated in other ways. When you are in a lab and you are studying a problem that nobody, your advisor, nobody really knows the answer to and you realize the consequences and the challenges of your work and you're realizing that you are balancing the complex theoretical nature of your project with the reality of are the dishes getting washed in the lab and you're trying to figure out how to manage those pieces. There is a type of inquiry and study that you cannot simulate any other way. I do not see research as competing with at the main university an undergraduate mission or at the medical school with a UGME mission. I see it directly complementary to that fact. The third reason that we have it is because of the faculty themselves. So every single person who is doing research has a terminal degree that was first and foremost a research-based degree. All of the biomedical sciences faculty here, all of the engineering faculty, all of the science faculty were trained researchers. They went to graduate school because they had that path, that vision in mind. And by offering an environment where research can grow and thrive, we both recruit a different type of faculty member, but we also create the ability to retain that person and to keep them engaged. Because if you are involved in external research, you have no choice but to remain current and on the cutting edge of what's happening in your field. You will not stagnate. You will not lose interest. And that is a critical component of what we do as well. And lastly, one of the four pillars of the university is about serving as an economic engine for the region. Well, while research will not generate a lot of revenue for the university, what does happen as, as projects spin out, as new devices, as new treatments, as new tests begin to develop, we have an infrastructure in place to help faculty commercialize those developments to help drive the economic engines of the region. And so research allows us to tap into all of those pieces. And as we do that, we recognize that when CMSRU was created, the focus had to be on developing an innovative curriculum, on recruiting the first wave of students, in making sure that curriculum was going to do everything imaginable to help the students place for their GME and make LCME accreditation and all of those other pieces. But having successfully done that, it's now time for the school to evolve, much as the university has, as to balance that teaching mission with that mission of creating knowledge and discovery and using that as a force to drive the economic development for the region. We have wonderful partners to work with. The collaboration between what's happening in Camden and what's happening in Glassboro and Stratford is, is ripe for growth. And that's really why the president decided that it was time to put serious money into that project. So the president committed $50 million over 10 years, roughly $5 million a year, 
to drive those research endeavors. So we can see some of that money going towards helping enhance startup packages for new researchers and attracting better researchers. We can see some of that money potentially going to help attract existing research groups to jumpstart some research. But we see a large chunk of that money going to fund collaborative research in health and health sciences between Camden, Glassboro, Stratford, as really helping those programs leverage each other. Now we did an RFP right before summer broke out with a September deadline. And we were questioning in the first year, how would the response be to that? That was not an enormous time to build new collaborations. It was not an enormous amount of time to write proposals if you had not already done so. So the proposal deadline was last week. We received 86 submissions from the RFP. So clearly, the interest is there, the connectivity is there. We are now going through the process of bringing in external reviewers to evaluate those proposals with awards hopefully coming by December. Um, I'm sure everybody out there who submitted was wondering that answer. It's coming by December. But I think that says that not only is there a financial commitment, but there is clearly a will from the investigators themselves to take advantage of this and grow. And I can't think of a better way to recognize and acknowledge that growth and, and that process than the first CMSRU Research Day. I think it's a critical component, and I think this is going to be one of those things that we look back on five years from now and have that same look at where we were and look at where we are story that we've just told about the university. So thank you all for coming today. I'm really looking forward to hearing the talks. Enjoy your day. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our uh, first speaker of the day, uh, Dr. Ross McKinney, Jr., Chief Scientific Officer of the Association of American Medical Colleges. Dr. McKinney received his bachelor's degree from Dartmouth College and earned his medical degree from the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry. He completed his internship and residency in pediatrics and fellowship in pediatric infectious diseases at Duke University Medical Center. He joined the Association of American Medical Colleges in 2016 after serving as a member of the Duke faculty since 1985. During his time at Duke, he was director of the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases, vice dean for research at Duke University School of Medicine and director of the Trent Center for Bioethics, Humanities, and History of Medicine. Among his career highlights, Dr. McKinney was first author of the key phase one and phase two studies on zidovudine use in children, and he conducted research on the natural history, prevention, and, and treatment of pediatric HIV disease. In his role as Chief Scientific Officer, Dr. McKinney leads an array of AAMC programs that support all aspects of medical research and training. He also represents the AAMC nationally on issues related to research and science policy, administration, workforce development, and education and training. So please join me in welcoming Dr. McKinney. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Um, it's a little daunting to look out at a crowd um, this, this large, but I hope that what I'll be able to do is to talk about um, where I see research going, um, biomedical research, and a little bit about you should look at it in two ways. In some, I frame this as how an institution might look at their investment in research and at the same time, you should look at it for those of you who are at the beginning of your career, 
where do I think research is going to go? Because it's time, if you're interested in research, to think about what directions look like they might be promising uh, from your perspective. So let's see how uh, we go. Click. Okay. So I'm going to talk about a review of some of the uh, uh, existing science that I think has been really exciting. This has been a great time for, for research um, in the United States and in the world. And then I'm going to talk some about the landscape of um, biomedical research in general and some about the opportunities that I think exist. So here are my conflict of interest statements, which frame the perspective, and you've just heard my biography, but the things that you might also want to know, I spent, uh, I'm employed by the Association of American Medical Colleges, so I have a certain bias about the importance of the rule, the role of schools of medicine in transforming our society. Uh, I happen to have an unpaid uh, consulting gig with the National Football League Players Associations, which tells you I have sort of an eccentric path to my career. And um, I'm also uh, an unpaid member on several data safety monitoring boards for Gilead Science who develop uh, drugs for hepatitis C and HIV. So when people talk about the future of something, they are assuming wisdom they simply don't have. And, and um, the first statement I have on that is that half of what we are going to teach you is wrong and half is right. Our problem is that we don't know which half is which. That goes back to 1944. And, and it's true that we know we are learning all the time and we are learning new things, we are discovering new things, and in that process, the old information goes out. We don't know what the truth is ultimately gonna be in a lot of things, and that's true of the nature of this uh, talk. Now, usually when people talk about the future of biomedical research, they start with a quotation from Yogi Berra, and the quotation they begin with um, is, the future ain't what it used to be. Um, I'm not going to use the Yogi Berra quotation, I'm going to use, uh, from Niels Bohr. Prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future. So this is a caveat about what I'm about to talk about. And when a Nobel laureate says that, you kind of go, you know, the guy's pretty smart. He's probably got that figured out. The other quotation I like is from that very sage anonymous. A good forecaster is not smarter than anyone else. He merely has his ignorance better organized. So what you will see is a very well-organized talk that I hope is only partially reflective of ignorance. Uh, this is an amazing time in science, and I hope you appreciate how incredible it is the way that medicine is being transformed, that our understanding of biological processes is being transformed, and our ability to manipulate them has tools that people could never have thought of before. So, we have, within my lifetime, um, which began in 1953, um, organ transplantation, first organ transplantation was in 1954, and now it's an everyday occurrence. Um, CT scans came about in 1972. Whew, that was not my intention. CT scans came about in 1972, and therapeutic or, or evaluative diagnostic MRIs in 1977. Smallpox was eradicated in 1977. When I was a pediatric resident, the real bane of our residency was Haemophilus type B um, meningitis. How many of you in this room who are medical have ever seen a case of Haemophilus type B meningitis? A few gray hairs. That's miraculous because that's what and not everybody has gray hair. Uh, the, the, that was what our bane was. Every night you would get in the emergency room cases of H. flu B meningitis, and they were devastating. The poor kids, you know, it's just sort of a liquefactive process on the surface of the brain. It was awful, and it's gone because of a vaccine that was developed originally in 1985, and then we learned that by conjugating the polysaccharide antigen of the H. flu B organism with a protein, you could convince the immune system to respond. Babies' immune systems don't respond well to polysaccharides, but they do to proteins. And so by hooking that um, polysaccharide onto a protein, babies' immune systems were able to recognize this pathogen and, and block it at an antibody level. We have cures for most childhood leukemia. Um, and so there's a lot that's changed. 
We're now in the early stages of what's going to be an incredible transformation of medicine, which is the genomic revolution. As we begin to understand the genetics and genomics, the epigenetics of, of what it is to be human, um, we are going to be understanding diseases in a totally different way. And, and I think that personalized medicine, which is one of the outgrowths of that, may be overhyped, but I don't think the understanding that we're getting of how disease processes happen through our understanding of genetics is underrated. I think that's really going to be key, and that's going to continue to be an area that's fruitful for exploration. Um, we're starting to see treatments for single gene defects. And, and to me, this is another amazing thing. So the school I was at, the, the, the program I was trained in at Duke, we had a big program in um, congenital immunodeficiency syndromes. So uh, we had lots of patients with severe combined immunodeficiency, SCID, uh, in, in the hospital at any given point in time. It's gone. You know, it's because we can treat it through transplant or through genetic manipulation. It's amazing. Um, we now have therapies that can treat cancers. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And, and our life expectancies at a near record high. But there's a caveat there. So here's life expectancy going from, you know, 19, 1895. It just keeps climbing, climbing, climbing. Oh, this was ended in 2014. You'll notice everybody this is what happened with the Spanish flu, which caused a big drop in life expectancy because it tended to hit people relatively early in life. It got people in their uh, teens and 20s uh, as the primary people who had the highest mortality. So a big drop then. But then we've had a steady improvement over time. Uh, this is where things are in the US. For Asian Americans, life expectancy is 87.3 years. This was in 2011. For Latinos in the United States, it's 83.5 years. For Caucasians, 78.7. And a lot of people were surprised that, in fact, uh, Hispanics and Latinos have such a uh, greater life expectancy than, and, than the white population. And this is something that, or the, the Caucasian population, non-Hispanic Caucasian population. But it's, uh, it's been a consistent trend for many years. Um, Native Americans, 75, and African Americans, 74.3. So we have some room to improve, to try and bring the groups together, um, and we have aspirations in that 87.3 years. What's changed, in part, has been what the mix of mortality looks like. We've made huge strides in cancer, uh, or in, in, in heart disease mortality, less in cancer. Now, the catch here is that everybody's going to die of something. And, and what we have done is to shift to a degree from heart disease towards cancer. And, and there's a fair bit of research as to why. So this is a technology map of cardiac mortality. And you can see cardiac mortality began to change in 1970, which was when the first coronary artery bypass graft surgery was done. Um, here you get your statins, defibrillators, um, here you get stints, but that probably wasn't really what made the difference. I think the public health map is a better one because in about 1970 we recognized the importance of smoking and began to change the um, incidence of smoking in the United States. And as smoking fell, cardiac mortality also fell. It's also had an effect on cancer, but it's been much slower. It's just changed the mix of cancers as much as anything. Now, there are successes and there are failures. So this is looking, this is a chart that shows you mortality rates. And, and what you hope is that mortality rates fall. And, and you can see that for Hispanics, they already had a low death rate per 100,000 and it's been steadily improving. It's gone down from 2000 to 2015. White non-Hispanics overall, pretty stable, slight increase. Uh, African-American all-cause mortality has been falling fairly dramatically, real progress. But for white non-Hispanics who have high school or less, the mortality rate has been increasing steadily. And, and this is, should be 
cause for real alarm, or at least a sense of this is a population where we need to target those causes of mortality if we're going to change these curves. This is a subject for research. It's also a subject for working on opioids because um, when you see where the shift has happened, so this was all-cause mortality of white non-Hispanics, 45 to 54. It wasn't that bad nationally in 2000. And the darker colors reflect higher mortality rates. And you can kind of see where in the South and in some of the central parts of the country, the rates have become incredibly higher than they were. And that reflects, to a great degree, the opioid epidemic. The primary causes of mortality that are seen in that 45 to 50 year old group are what are referred to as the diagnoses of despair. Um, alcoholic liver failure, narcotic overdose, suicide. So we need, we need to do research that can make a difference in this population because this is where the trend is the worst. Now, we also need to continue to do research that will help improve, particularly at a public health level, the African-American mortality, which is still higher than it should be. So it's not to discount a very important part of our population, but it's to say, at the moment, the fire that we should be putting some water on seems to be in that 45 to 50 year old group. So I'm now gonna talk about some of the examples of big successes where we have made a difference. And, and this is one that I was involved in fairly closely for most of my career. So the HIV epidemic was first identified in 1981 when Michael Gottlieb at UCLA uh, described a series of patients who had um, pneumocystis uh, pneumonia. And that was the first recognition that something was different. Um, the first pediatric case was recognized in 1982. And in 1985, there was a phase one study of zidovudine in adults. And we actually gave the first child uh, zidovudine in October 1986. Um, and at that point, life expectancy for HIV infected children was about three and a half years. And mother to child transmission rate was 25%. Those numbers are very, very different now. Um, because a series of trials was done um, as collaborations between the government, the NIH, and industry, where we developed drugs, we developed strategies. There was a, an agreement that it was such an important um, crisis that we should do things in a collaborative way rather than assigning it to the proprietary world of the pharmaceutical companies or doing it through just the NIH, it had to be collaborative. And so we made incredibly rapid progress in a very short period of time. The other thing that was critical to the success was the engagement of the community who was most affected. So in all of the planning, in all of the strategies around the trials, at first not, but then around 1990, it was like impossible to think about designing a study for HIV without involving members of the affected community as part of the design team. And that was another key transformation that, that made this rapid progress possible. Uh, the life expectancy for HIV infected children now, it was three and a half years, we can't calculate it now because the mortality rate is low enough that we just don't know um, how long people who were born with HIV infection and were treated from their early years, how long they will live. And our assumption is they're gonna have basically normal lifespans. Um, the mother to child transmission that was 27% is now less than 1%. If you recognize that a woman is HIV infected and you suppress her virus down to undetectable levels, she is almost certainly not going to transmit to the baby. This is an incredible change. But it's an incredible change here in the US where we both recognize the infected mother and we have the treatments available. It's a much longer, slower process to make the same kind of transformation in Africa and other parts of the world where HIV is still an epidemic disease. Um, and the other thing that's been phenomenal is our ability to move from complex cocktails where we're giving people multiple drugs, four drugs a day, twice a day, three times a day, to uh, once a day, one pill regimens, 
which is just incredible because it makes it possible to, to view this as a chronic disease that's, that's a manageable chronic disease. And, and very near on the horizon is going to be the use of depot drugs where you inject once a month and that's the treatment. So no, adherence isn't even remembering a pill once a day. It's remembering to go to the clinic once a month to get your depot injection. It is a huge transformation in what was for a long time an incredibly lethal disease that just looked hopeless. Now, I talked about SCID, uh, Severe Combined Immunodeficiency Syndrome. And um, much of SCID these days gets treated by bone marrow transplantation. You uh, are able to do um, uh, autologous, no, rather uh, allogeneic transplantations um, of half-matched donors and have an almost certain success rate. The one exception to that was um, adenosine deaminase deficiency syndrome version, um, ADA version of, um, of SCID. And now there is, because it's a single gene defect, there's a treatment which Glaxo developed in, um, in Europe. And they are able to insert the, uh, the ADA gene into um, a cell that is then transplanted into the child. And it's curative. And they'll have a normal life expectancy. And the only catch is, like a lot of these gene therapies, that's $650,000 a case. So one of the things that we're finding at the moment with gene therapies is they hold tremendous promise, but their price tags have been astronomical. And, and I'm not sure where that's going to go because we as a society are not going to be able to sustain this cost um, for our, uh, the wide number of diseases with single gene defects that potentially are treatable with a variety of strategies um, for genetic treatments. Uh, another just incredible recent example, so um, spinal motor atrophy is a syndrome that is the commonest cause of genetic fatalities in infants. And basically, they get very rapid neuronal loss. Their neurons lack a protein that, that normally protects them from uh, byproducts, uh, internal byproducts. And so the cells die, the patients become flaccid, um, initially, they just get, you see the motor weakness, and then they get respiratory weakness, and then they die. And they all die, typically within a few months. Well, what's been developed is an adenovirus-associated uh, AAV9 um, that includes that gene. And you can inject this virus vector intravenously, and it will get into the central nervous system. And of the 15 kids that were treated, and you have to treat them very early on, so it's typically a patient who gets recognized very quickly or had a SIB who had spinal motor atrophy. Um, but if you treat them very quickly, um, 15 of 15 are surviving in the initial clinical trial. And a few of them are walking. They all sit, or no, 11 of 15 sit. Um, but it's, it's pretty remarkable when what you used to see was them all die. So this is the kind of incredible strides we are making. And we're going to see more and more of that. Because there are currently 2,000 trials ongoing for gene defects, uh, including sickle cell, including um, diseases like whiskered Aldrich syndrome, which pediatricians used to learn to recognize, retinal diseases, uh, metachromatic leukodystrophy, adrenal leukodystrophy, lots of things. We are seeing a transformation and therapeutic strides that are absolutely incredible in these single gene defects that have been a bane of humankind for as long as we've been aware, particularly things like sickle cell. We're going to be treating it and curing it. It's just, it is, to my mind, remarkable. Um, another remarkable change has been our ability to do immunotherapy for cancer, to use the individual's own immune system to target and kill cancer cells. It's an imperfect art so far, but it was a non-art a decade ago. And, and now we are able to affect somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of patients with tumors. So the, the basic biology of this is that um, normal cells have a ligand on their surface, PDL1, 
And, and when the PD-1 or CD-80 of a CD-8 cytotoxic lymphocyte binds to the normal cell, it is protected if it has the, um, the PD-1. Now, cancer cells have, an, or rather PD-L1, cancer cells overexpress PD-L1, so that protects them. So what um, Jim Allison um, proposed was that um, you could inhibit that binding. And, and as a result, the cytotoxic CD8 cells would continue to attack the tumor cells. And, and the brand names of drugs that we see, you know, Keytruda, Optivo, Tencetric, they all have brand, generic names that go XXXUMAB um, because they're all monoclonal antibody based. Um, it's created a whole class of drugs. And I think those of you who follow the news um, know Jimmy Carter, age 91. He was treated for metastatic melanoma, which was a uniformly fatal disease that affected his brain. He had metastases to the brain. Uh, that was in 2015. He was treated with um, pembrolizumab, and he is lesion-free and continues to perk along now at 94. Pretty amazing story um, that we have. And Jim Allison and Tosuku Hanjo both got the Nobel Prize yesterday for um, this particular category of work. Another local success right across the river um, was CAR T cells. And these are chimeric, chimeric antigen receptor T cells that um, are taken from the patient. A vector is used to insert a gene so that they target, typically this has been most effective for B cells, so they target antigens that are present on B cells and um, they've been approved for treatment of ALL and large B cell lymphoma. And again, those were diseases at the point at which these were usually refractory patients. These were people who were gonna die. The new therapy, expensive, but the new therapy gives hope. The other area that's just been remarkable is CRISPR, the ability to edit genes. Um, and CRISPR uh, is a gene that targets uh, clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. This is a means that prokaryotes protect themselves from uh, viruses and phage. And, and basically they insert and, and manipulate the, um, the gene. So what you do is, what, what biologically happens is the CRISPR is a sequence and then Cas9 or some other CRISPR associated um, short uh, protein um, will we'll manipulate, will edit, excise, or, or excise and allow for repair of the genome. And slowly but surely, CRISPR is being used now all the time in creating animal and cell models. And very soon, I think, we'll be seeing it in therapeutic trials in people. There are some, and I think it may actually turn out that it's able to be effective. The worry at the moment on the human trials is off-target effects, that the CRISPR can be targeted but not precisely enough. So lots and lots of good news in what we are doing in science. It's just a, just a small scratching of the surface. I didn't, you know, cardiologists are seeing progress, infectious disease doctors are seeing progress. We're really doing remarkable things. Um, but now let's think about the practical side of this. What can an individual or an institution do to get the mix right for how they do research? And, and I'm particularly thinking about giving advice um, to an institution like Cooper Royan that's going to be building a program. And so what kinds of things will people want to be thinking about as they build a program? What are the options? What are the realistic models? And, and how can the institution make a difference in people's lives? Because ultimately, the reason that we do all the scientific work is to make a difference in people's lives. So, Let's think about broad categories first. So there's basic science, laboratory-based research. I'll talk some about what the pluses and minuses, but think of, think of the lab rats, think of people who are working either in animal models or in laboratories, in in vitro systems, and um, just working in the lab. Then there's translational research. Translational research begins with the ideas that come out of basic science re research, and it starts when there is an intent to move it into human beings. 
So um, sometimes the ideas may be in materials, may be in engineering, may be, um, and sometimes they may be drugs, they may be cell therapies. It's gonna be you start with some basic science observation and you go, we wanna take it into people either for understanding or to make a difference uh, in treatment. Then there's clinical research, which um, is a relatively easy thing for an institution to pick up because clinicians can do it. Uh, and at one level, it's just accrual, but then you move on and you get into the design of studies, you get into the um, building of studies, the working with people who are um, in the translational arena because translational things will be phase ones, first in human, early phase two, and then you get into the clinical research when you do the larger studies, and it's important to have the involvement of clinicians in those clinical research questions. And then finally, there are the computation-based domains, which have been a growth industry. Uh, things like epidemiology, public health research, health service research, and big data. The use of information that is available now that we're using electronic medical records to try and draw from those electronic medical records lessons that teach us about um, diseases or treatments and options that we have. So when you try and decide what an institution or you, if you're doing a career in research, will want to focus on, what you should think about are first, why are we doing this? What is the purpose of research? There's the intrinsic gain of understanding and getting new knowledge. There is the um, goal of improving health through research, which should be particularly focused on your local environment because you wanna make a difference to people who you are touching in other ways at the institution. And it's important to talk with your local community to better understand what are the local needs. I mean, you have a sense, but the perception of the community is gonna be, it's very important to understand what their perception is if you want to do your work of doing research for the community well. <clears throat> uh, you need to think about what, what the role of uh, the funding will be. It is a means to grow the institution because you will be able to get some funding, but research never fully pays for itself. But as you begin to fund some research, it will pay off faculty who were there and allow you to start using whatever pool of money you had to grow. And hopefully you are able to grow up and out and expand things so that the same institutional investment, in fact, gets more and more and more community research benefit because the number of people who are able to be covered increases as the people who were previously there have generated their own funding sources. Uh, it enhances the reputation of the institution, and research also can build the identity institution. If you see yourselves and your institution as good at something, it's, a, it's an important part of an institution's identity. So basic science, why do basic science? So it's laboratory-based. It's incredibly expensive to start with it. Uh, building laboratories costs a lot of money. Maintaining laboratories costs a lot of money. The core labs that, that typically basic scientists need, um, they need to be able to get certain assays run, certain uh, uh, cryo EMs, for example, you know, $10 million a hit. Um, but it's also an opportunity to collaborate. And one of the ways to make basic science more cost effective is to do it in collaboration. And you've got a very natural collaboration because you've got a university right down the street and you've got partners right across the river. So, so there is a way to build a basic science program here that may not be as expensive as it would be. And I guess you've got a new building coming in. So, so collaborations are a good way to build basic science, although it's intrinsically expensive. About half of NIH money goes to basic science, half of it goes to clinical research. There is support from industry and foundations Basic science has to be done by our schools of medicine because nobody else does it anymore. Industry's gotten completely out of the business of doing it. It used to be, you know, a Burroughs Welcome would have a basic science laboratory. Um, people got Nobel, Laurie, uh, Nobel Prizes out of the Burroughs Welcome lab. Um, Pfizer had basic, they're all out of it. They, they've, the drug companies no longer do basic science. We are depending on our schools of medicines and universities to do basic science, so it's critical. It's expensive, but it's critical. And it inevitably loses money. The, the indirect costs don't cover what it really costs, but ever so often you make that really crucial discovery that makes a difference in people's lives. 
translational research is the bench to bedside to dissemination. It's the taking the idea from the lab, taking it to the clinic, then disseminating it into the community and using it. And it begins, as I said before, with the intent to develop a drug, device, or diagnostic. And, and the facilities change. You know, you can do this relatively inexpensively at the later ends. The early stages are typically pretty expensive. Um, it requires that an institution develop regulatory support. So if you're going to do a lot of translational research, you need to have people who understand the FDA process, who understand uh, investigational new drug applications, who understand the device exemptions, because um, you won't be able to do the work effectively unless you have that available as a resource. Um, it requires specialized research expertise. If you're developing a drug, you need to have people who know about formulations, who know about how to either solubilize or put into a pill or a capsule or IV um, a, a new medication. You need to know what the potential toxicities are. You need pharmacologists, toxicologists. It requires a lot of specialized expertise if you get seriously into translational research. Uh, and typically you need animal. Uh, researchers because the phase for most translational research is you start with an idea, you try it out in animals, then it moves into early first in human studies. So you need to have the facilities that often are quite expensive to maintain. Um, and this is in the domain of the NIH, the um, National Center um, for, for Activities of Translational Science, NCATS, uh, and then there's the CTSA program. And to get a CTSA, which is one of the Clinical Translational Science Awards, typically an institution has to invest a lot of money and have a pretty good sized translational program going in order to be competitive. Uh, there are many approaches available in translational research. It does generally lose money for an institution. Um, and everybody wants to have, I guess you guys did get a good licensing. Um, but, but tech transfer offices, the idea is that institutions are allowed to patent ideas and technologies, and, and then when they do, they typically try and license it to industry. The tech transfer office at most institutions costs more money than it actually yields. And the cost of patenting turns out to be high. To do an international patent costs about $100,000. So, um, so going through the patenting process, you've got a really good idea. If you want to sell it, you're going to have to patent it. That starts to cost real money. And so the tech transfer office is a uh, cost center for most institutions as opposed to being a, uh, a revenue generator. But if you get a home run, then it becomes a revenue generator. And everybody keeps betting on the home runs. Uh, boards of trustees like tech transfer offices. Um, and it's also easy to convey translational research to the community. Because one of the things you want to do is to persuade the community that what you're doing matters. People understand translational research. Clinical research, usually low cost. You need an IRB. You need an office to monitor. So the places that are successful at doing clinical research generally have a central office that helps with the process of managing the studies. And it does a few things that are critical. That central office provides support and an interface between the IRB. They negotiate with um, the outside entities, typically pharmaceutical companies or contract research organizations, and they know what the standards are. Because if you have the faculty in the negotiation with the, um, with the pharmaceutical company or the CRO, they will be fleeced routinely. So it's really important to have an office that knows what it's doing, act as the contracting agent um, on, on um, working with the uh, uh, outside entities. Um, there are contributions that you can make as an institution in accrual, in supporting laboratory support of other people's clinical trials, in doing biostatistics or study design, and in data management. Those are all areas that academic centers routinely participate in in the clinical research process. And, and here's the, the notion about the clinical research office. Uh, you need it for the contracts. You need it for budget management during the course of the study so you don't lose money during the course of the study. You need it for regulatory support, the IRB, dealing with the FDA. And, and the other thing that they can be very important in managing are the personnel that do clinical research. Because most people who do clinical research have a clinical research nurse 
or other clinical research staff, and, and a one-to-one -one relationship ends up being fairly expensive, one investigator to one nurse. And, and often things go up and down in clinical research. Studies are open, studies are closed. And so what the clinical research office can do is to act as the agency that manages a larger number of, of clinical research staff so that there's a fallback position. If your PI at the moment does not have a clinical trial, you go to the clinical research office and they have you work in an adjacent field. Um, and, and it makes the whole operation more cost effective. And, and I don't, most institutions that have success in running their clinical research operations have both the regulatory support and the um, personnel support running through a central office. Computation, lots of excitement, the ability to look at all that electronic medical record data. There are international data sources. You can do meta-analysis, you can do epidemiology, you can do implementation research where you look and say, you know, what, what strategy should we use to treat this? What works best? You can compare one kind of treatment to a different kind of treatment. But the catch is that we're not, you will not, if you get into that field, you will not be alone. There are lots and lots of institutions getting into computational research, and it's really hard to get good people because the supply does not match the demand. So we've got this wonderful world of big data available, and if you are at all computationally skilled and interested in a research career, there is a crying need for people to do this kind of computational work because it's, it's manageable to do, but there are skills that are required and the supply is not currently meeting the demand. So what's a realistic model for an institution? Uh, you should think about who are our star faculty? Who are really good at our institution? Um, what do we need in our community? What does Camden need? What does Southern New Jersey need? Um, how can we match the resources that we have available to those community needs? Um, and then there are technical considerations like what, what are we going to have to invest in? How much of its infrastructure? How much of its people? How much cost? I mean, the typical recruitment package for a basic scientist is about one and a half to $1.8 million spread over three to five years. That's a lot of money. Um, and that's what the typical pool is that it's being used by people who will be competing for basic scientists who are grant funded that you might want to have. What will the ongoing expenses be if you're going to want to maintain the um, institution? The typical average rate is that an institution will spend 53 cents on every dollar that gets from the NIH. The more money that you, the bigger you get, um, that sometimes goes down, but still typically you're spending money on startup packages, on paying for people when they're between grants, um, on the difference between what their salary is and what the NIH will pay. All of those are factors that an institution has to think about. And, and that you who are thinking about a research career will have to think about where, where can I place myself and how well resourced is the institution that I'm going to work at. The schools of medicine need to make a difference. That's our obligation. We need to make a difference. and We do it in a bunch of ways. We do it by clinical care in our community. We do it by educating our next generation. We do it by modeling and training a diverse workforce. And we do it by doing research that improves health. And all of those cost money. And how do you balance it? If you're in a school of medicine, what is it you think about? So this is what the current funding environment looks like. This is a really nice curve. This is NIH budget. And from 2003, when we actually peaked at the end of the doubling in the NIH budget that Clinton began, and you see that it went up in actual dollars, and then we got sequestration, and it went down, and everybody got really distraught. But for the last um, four years, we've had steady increases and this has been a real bipartisan effort, um, both Republicans and Democrats in Congress supporting the NIH. And in, adjusted, in inflation adjusted dollars, we were falling, falling, falling. We were down about 20% from where we had been. And, and we are creeping back up towards where we were in 2003. So, so research from the federal government point of view, biomedical research, because that's what the NIH does, slowly but surely increasing. And, and with good congressional support, at least in the last few years. 
there have been an increased number of, so an RPG in NIH speak is a research project grant. So this is the R awards that most people want to get. And, and what you can see is that the number of R awards that the NIH has been giving out has been increasing. So the competition is fierce, but there's hope if you have the intent of getting into the pool of NIH investigators. Um, it's still not a great percentage, about 20%, 18% of NIH applications for an RPG get funded. But um, if you can get into the top fifth, um, you've got a chance of getting funded. And this is basic science, where there's been particularly a change in my, in my perception. So NIGMS is the National Institute for General Medical Science, and that's where basic science is. And they've been increasing their R awards fairly steadily, and you're up to about a 25% chance of getting funded if you're applying for a basic science award through the um, NIGMS. Here's what the budget picture looks like for schools of medicine. This is average, not Rowan or Cooper Rowan, but it's uh, the average is that 42% um, comes from the hospital. Uh, this is um, it's kind of hard to read. Basically, about 60% comes from clinical. 14% comes from the federal government. And um, next slide's better to see it. This is the curve of what the typical medical school budgets, how they're made up. This is the average. And so what you see is that this orange is clinical income. And, and about 60% of the budget of the typical medical school comes from either the hospital or the practice plan. Now, there are schools that have almost no revenue coming from their hospital and practice plan, and there are some that have tons of revenue coming from their hospital and practice plan. But, but this is different than the university in general, because this revenue stream is very dependent on what happens uh, to Medicare, Medicaid, and the insurance world. Um, and hospitals and universities become very dependent on that. And the other thing that happens is that hospitals change their affiliations. And, Schools that previously had a affiliation with one hospital may lose it because some private entity buys the academic hospital. And the private entity is gonna send the excess revenue to the uh, shareholders instead of necessarily giving it to the School of Medicine that was the historical owner of the hospital. So that's happened to several of our schools. The budget for research is only the federal part of it's 14%, and the overall budget for research is 16%. So um, much more of a school of medicine typically is running through the clinical revenue stream rather than the research stream. So now I'm gonna go into where I think the excitement lies for the future, and that'll be the concluding part of the talk. If you were thinking about where where the real excitement, where the real progress is gonna be made, if you were gonna be looking to, to get involved in research, what are some of the fields where there is gonna almost certainly be important strides. So computational research that's tied to genetic and genomic information. Um, and it's not gonna be, whoop, it's not gonna be um, the sequencing. Sequencing is just a tool. Sequencing now is largely done in China. Um, or it's done in big factories. It's not, a, um, it's not the research part that you want. What you want to think about is what do you do with the information that's coming out of the sequence, sequencing and how do you put it into understanding of disease or potentially therapeutic options. Um, regenerative medicine and, and tissue engineering are important um, areas that is going to be a growth because we are learning how to manipulate tissues and to grow tissues in new ways. And I think that's going to be a big, um, and you'll hear a whole talk about it this afternoon. So it's a very hot area um, for research. Cellular-based therapies. Uh, we know already that cell therapies for cancer but, but maybe we can give cell therapies for Parkinson's disease or genetic therapies for Parkinson's disease. Um, how are we gonna treat Alzheimer's? Um, there are lots of things where cell therapies may turn out to be important. Discussions about the use of cell therapies, stem cells and cardiac events. So I think we're gonna see continued growth in cell therapies as a form of um, treatment. 
diagnostics using a variety of biological markers. So getting into the realms of understanding proteomics, um, uh, genomic testing of, of, for example, cells floating through the body that are turned on, look, use of RNA to look at um, pathways because when RNA um, sequences start to go up, that indicates typically that a protein pathway is turned on. What is that pathway doing and how can we manipulate it? We'll see an increased number of antibody-based therapies. Um, we're already seeing it. The checkpoint inhibitors are antibody-based therapies. There are anti-tumor antibody therapies, anti-HIV therapies. Recent studies at infusion of, of monoclonal antibodies against HIV are able to keep it suppressed in patients who were otherwise refractory to treatment. And, and will we be able to use antibodies as a strategy to either prevent or um, to, to treat people who have difficult to treat HIV. And then there's the immunomodulation that you can do through antibody-mediated um, strategies. Things like autoimmune diseases, where, where the treatments these days are mostly monoclonals. Gene therapies, I already talked a lot about that. Single, defects, single gene defects will be first. Sickle cell, um, retinopathies, there are gonna be a bunch of them. Um, particularly now we're gonna get into the inborn metabolic errors that have to be treated early, but if you insert the gene in early, it's really gonna make a difference in the quality of kids' lives. Uh, clinical trials that use electronic health records and real-world evidence. The uh, 21st Century Cures Act gave the FDA the authority to use real-world evidence for uh, drug indications, and what that will mean is doing studies that are coming out of the clinic instead of necessarily being designed as a randomized clinical trial. And you may be able to use um, stuff that you gather, information you gather from the electronic medical records to change the indications that are available for a drug. I think we're gonna see continued emphasis on um, Alzheimer's treatments, and we're going to see uh, a lot of work done on late effects of infectious diseases, like the post-Lyme disease syndrome, that the persistent fatigue that happens after we believe that the Lyme disease organism has been completely treated, but people continue to have brain fog, fatigue, um, sleeplessness, lots of uh, long-term problems that has led to sort of an underground of treatments. We need to understand what that disease is so that we can treat it more effectively. Um, Post-viral syndromes in general, and I also think we're gonna see a lot more use of um, interfering RNAs as treatment because we're beginning to learn how to get those into tissues. Um, the first one was actually for spinal motor atrophy. Um, so I think we'll see more and more of that. And how do you do it? Well, research always loses money, but it serves the institution and it serves the community. It is therefore a worthwhile investment. Clinical research is relatively easy to launch it's a good place for most institutions to start. The key is to be able to do it in such a way that you became a thought leader instead of just an agent of accrual. But even being an agent of accrual, in some worlds, like in cancer, people like to participate in clinical trials because they feel like they're at the cutting edge. And if you are participating in clinical trials, the institution begins to get a reputation for being the sort of cutting edge place that most people would like to get their treatment. Uh, translational research is a good middle ground and is a particularly good target where you have an engineering school or um, a pharmacology school or partnerships with people that can provide some of the heavier technologies. Um, but I would say, you know, it makes sense. If that's the sort of thing that where you have a good partnership already started, um, it makes sense to get into that part of translational research. Diagnostics or devices, drug development's expensive. And then big data and analytics is hot, but the star researchers are few. They're hard to recruit. They're very expensive. It looks like it should be cheap, but it isn't because of the fact that they need a lot of resources and typically bring with them a pack of people who are relatively expensive. So in spite of challenges that I've kind of walked through, it's a, it's a really exciting time to be in research because we're making a difference. We're changing people's lives. And, and that's what we should be trying to do. And I think that we are. There will always be barriers to doing good science. The funding has always been cyclical, but there's a joy in discovery. There's a joy in improving people's lives. And, and done well, making that difference 
um, is a good reason to be involved in research. And it makes me particularly appreciative of being here on the first research day here at, uh, at Cooper Ruan. I think you've got uh, a, a rich future ahead of you, a very promising one, uh, and I wish you all well in that expedition. So thank you. Go ahead and ask. I am happy to answer any questions that people may have. It is an incurious crowd interested in lunch. Okay. So you mentioned that it's difficult to re recruit stars for big data analysis. But do you think there's a path by which you can build a certain amount of practical infrastructure and then help to attract people, or do you have to get that star? I think it's, you're going to have to have some of that infrastructure, yes, in order to recruit. And it's good to develop people locally, but you could do, for example, what traditionally has been. You send the person off from here to go work with, um, you know, in a tool butte or somebody like that, and then you bring them back and, and give them the tools uh, by learning, but then bring them back here to start to build a program. Give them, the, give them the sense that there's going to be a program when they get back that they can build. Well, I suspect it looks like people are interested in lunch, so enjoy. <laughs>